So I came to CAS, ooh, how long ago was it now? It must have been, I'm trying to do the maths in my head, about 2008. I started in year seven. Um, so I remember coming in, doing, doing my, um, we did my, the, the test that you need to get in on test, but you know, the paper you yeah. to get in, and, you know, in the hall with what, 100 and how many people. And then, yeah, very, obviously, exceptionally grateful to be able to get in. I remember Rita was sort of, you know, we got on really well. And yeah, as, as the process went on, it was, I mean, it was amazing. Started, I think, with one of seven or eight in our year at the time. And yeah, was here all the way through from year seven up till year 13. Was finished in 2015. And yeah, it was amazing. I loved, loved every minute. I can't speak of it high. And I, I now sort of evangelize about it wherever I go, which is a nice thing to have about school. You know, it's the, the things that make cast and that probably still make cast cast is, is that, I guess, the sense that you are an individual, right? And you're treated as somebody completely unique rather than being boxed and pigeonholed. And I think, you know, seeing so many friends of mine who work at different schools experience the opposite where they're sort of you know forced to move with the times or move with the the status quo whatever people around them their friends their teachers thought they had to be that's the opposite here i think one thing that was all through everyone i knew in my year and in every year to be fair was the sense that you were treated completely as an individual and whatever your needs were catered, catered for and i think yeah i mean i'm incredibly grateful for that the amount of things i got to try the amount of fun i got to have the amount of amazing projects Namibia, Cam, all the trips we did, the amount of, I mean, when I think back to it, how amazing it was, given that so many people in so many schools never get the chance to have that kind of experience. And so I can only be exceptionally grateful for all the teachers and the setup here, because I don't think you could have this setup anywhere else. And I think it's a testament to the incredible history of 125 years, building this ethos and embedding it into the soil of the fields to the point where you can't help but be part of that and, and experience that when you're here. Yeah. There's no desire to leave <laughs> when you're here. I think, I think that's one thing. You just feel like your home and is the extension of home rather than it being somewhere that you, you know, I obviously can't speak for all children, but somewhere where you dread to go or a place which you're, you have that, that, I guess, that unattraction to. And I think in most schools, you don't really feel that secure and that safe. And here you definitely do, which is amazing. And again, I don't think it could really be replicated anywhere else. I think it's a very unique King Alfred thing. And I think everyone who leaves says exactly the same. What was it like coming in, in year seven, when there were students who'd already been here from reception? I'm kind of interested. Yeah, no, it's, I think it, I mean, it was such, such a long time ago now, it's weird to think about it. I think it had its challenges, of course, because you've got friends who are already set friends, you've got groups and definition. I think a lot of, you know, when, you, when most people start in year seven and everyone's on that, that, oh, we need to all make friends and join in thing. And I think that wasn't the case by definition, right? You have people who are already friends with people 10 years, 11 years, someone sometimes since they were a little baby. So I think, yeah, it was definitely a challenge in some respects, but then also everyone was so welcoming and brilliant. And we found, I found friends really quickly. I think all of us did, every single person came in, slotted into, and that's partly why they were, I guess, chosen, because it was easy. It didn't feel like we were different to anyone else. It, it kind of, yeah, it, from day one felt natural and felt like home. And, and I think, yeah, again, that's part of the spirit in this place. It's very welcoming, very, open to people and as such it wasn't that much of an adjustment even though of course it was a weird thing I guess starting school with people who'd already been at school with each other of course what did you do for GCSE and then what are your subjects so let me think right I did for GCSE obviously the main ones I think we did English what did we do English I did Trump science history music yeah. it's really we're thinking back IT, the IT with Kat, it was me, it was literally just me and her. <laughs> I remember doing IT GCC. I did a couple of others I can't even remember. But I did 10. Four stars by Maze and the B. I just remember that, which was, which was pretty decent. And then A level, I did music tech, history. It's so weird, you just forget. Music tech, history, English, and politics, and one more comment. Being here where we're sat, one distinct memory, not so much from GCC, I think A level was really where. I guess you, you're, you're a bit smart at A-level, you know, you know a bit more, you've been through it a little bit. And I think politics with Penny, and it was myself, Clemente, Christy, Alex, who else, Katie, yeah. the brothers, and we, and we were literally a group of like five million people doing politics. And it was amazing, it was literally the most fun thing in the world. I remember we come up and it was, what, two, three sessions a week in that little room, just the five of us. And again, it was such a cast thing, but it was just us four, five, we'd bring snacks from like Sainsbury's, we'd like, you know, go down the road and get stuff bringing in. It was just so much fun. And we, we became like this little group and this little family. And it was this weird coming together with people, but it was honestly one of the highlights, I think, of school thinking back to it in terms of the sort of academic time. And 
yeah, again, you can never have that. A group of five of us studying politics for a year together. And yeah, it was, it was a joy. I think that's one thing. I remember distinctly English as well, being brilliant. And we had a real, real group and a real kind of connection between us as a, as a unit of what, like 10, I think, mm. maybe to eight to 10. Um, and yeah, that was great fun. It was all, it was all fun. I mean, like, it's weird thinking back. And I can't remember too many details, it was so long ago, but I just remember it, it was just a great fun time. Yeah, and like to think about my GCC medals as being a good experience is much more I think than most people can say. Especially when you leave, you hear people's experience of schools, it's definitely not like that for most. No, I loved it. I, I literally loved coming to school. It was a day that I didn't enjoy being here. And also the day that I didn't enjoy being here actually like in lessons, which again is a very rare thing, I think, most times you go to school. And it's about being, obviously, of course, it's being with your friends and the fun stuff out of the lessons and the class time, but actually that was so pivotal to it, I think, because we all enjoyed it so much and just had a great time. And I think, yeah, I must have been 17. I applied for my uni stuff. Um, but so and Julie was, he was obviously leading on careers and still probably is, as you're saying, to a degree. We did all our university stuff, the work experience in year 10. It got to the point in year 13 where obviously we went to apply and do that whole process, you cast and everything else. And I just had this thing, and I don't know how, how well favored this would be here, but I had this thing where I just felt as if uni was just going to be the biggest waste of time. The biggest, I just knew, I had this in state that it was just, this is not for me. And still, I'd applied, I'd done the process, got into King's College, which was my number one, studying digital culture, which was a degree. It was, again, it's a degree that you want to do when you don't want to do a degree, you know. It was kind of a, it was the first year they were doing it, it was different and so on, but I just had, again, had an instinct that it wasn't quite right. So I tried and I said, okay, let me just see if there's anything else I can do. And a friend of mine, Noah, he had the work experience, I think, at Vice in year 10. And I just remember Vice being a company that I thought, okay, they're cool, they do good stuff. Let me just see if there's anything that, I didn't know what they did really, I just think they make good content, they were cool, that was always a thing, right? Vice is cool, back in the day. But I remember saying, okay, let me try and see. And he had all these emails, he had about 20 emails on a thread, and I remember seeing it and said, no, do you mind just like forwarding me that thread? So I said, yeah, cool, so he sent me the thread. And so I made an email basically saying to everyone on that email thread independently, and I said, well, just email 100 emails and get two back and that's all you need. And I remember emailing them and saying, this is me, this is what I do. I'd love to just come in and have a conversation and, and learn a bit more about what you do at Vice and just, yeah, suss it out and, and get some advice more than anything. So I hit out to 20 people, got two back, went in to meet them, I think the following week, and I met a guy called Ian Richardson through Emilia Abraham, who was the one who replied to me. Ian was the head of the agency there, and he said, would you like to come to work experience? I was like, yeah, of course, we'd love to. So I spent my whole summer, I went to Glastonbury that weekend, turned 80, came back, and then spent my whole summer there, which was amazing. And then went off with Ian after that to go set up the agency over at Lab Bible. Um And so, yeah, it was funny being, <laughs> being here in that life, like, should have been revising for politics, and I wasn't, I wasn't doing it. But sometimes, different times, these things need to be done. And yeah, I see that was probably the most pivotal moment, one of the most pivotal moments of my whole life, because if I'd never sent that email, I'd never have got, I guess, the option or the, uh, the experience to then leave uni. When I did, I, just to finish that story, I dropped out of uni over that Christmas. We had a Christmas party after that summer, and I just remember being there at Vice while I was also at uni. I was at Vice every Friday, uni for the four days, and just hated uni. It was a horrible experience, awful. Um, it was just a waste of time. And I just remember being there, seeing Vice on the Friday. This is digital culture, and I'm studying it, but the real work was that I was there and was the actual thing. It was the real deal. So I remember speaking to Ian and the creative director, and we had a conversation, and they said, look, if you want to join us full time, we'd love to have you. I said, let's do it. Went back that morning then after the Christmas party and dropped out, which said all the emails are done. And then started advice after Christmas. So yeah. I think I just had a sense that I'd always been somebody who liked to get stuck in and do stuff and get on with it more than anything. And I'd done that all the way through my school I'd been schooling experience. I've made music, I've been I'm plug, like, I've done all these things and set up I cleared the company and started a film magazine with friends, I've done loads of different projects and real tangible things. I just felt as if uni was going to be a long, well, expensive for one, and a lot of time spent not doing but learning. And I just felt as if, no, I needed to get stuck in. That was the instinct. I didn't really know much around that, but my vibe is just it wasn't right. And it turned out to be exactly it. So I'm so glad that, again, sent those emails, got to go to Vice, see the real world, experience it properly in the media and creative industry, which obviously they were the front runner of. And from there, it made it a no brainer to then leave. And I put a lot of that to this place, really. I put so much of that, the experimentation that you, we could do during school. You spend so much of your life at school. I think it has to be a place where you can do things and try things and 
experiment and play and ultimately have the freedom within the confines of school to start projects, to get on the stuff, to make stuff happen. And that's what we did. And it was incredibly supportive all the way through Key Afro was of everything I wanted to do. And it meant that, yeah, I, I had the time to try and ultimately that then helped me to understand that the thing that I wanted to do was that it was create projects, start brands, build things in the creative and social and online space. And that then set me up, I think, really nicely for the future. So I guess from, from Vice, I went to Lab Bible, um, from Lab, I set up my own sort of Gen Z marketing agency called Roundabout. From there, I went to YMU, uh, which is a management company, looking after like most of, sort of TVs, people like Anton mm-hmm. Deck and Holly Winnerby at the time, Reggie Yates, all those sort of people, which is brilliant. I was chief creative officer there for three and a half years and then went to start my company called Arcade Media, which is a vehicle really, and it's slightly, not hidden, but okay, this is the focus. Our job really is to manage the sidemen. So the sidemen are the biggest sort of YouTube creative group in, in the world, or one of the biggest in the world, biggest in Europe for sure, made of seven individual creators who kind of came together about 10 years ago. So a long time they've been doing it. They're huge, it's the kind of thing where like, they're, they're probably the biggest celebrities in the country, but you know, most people over the age of 41, like, no, everyone under will, and it's always like, ask the kids, who's only the answer? <laughs> And yeah, they've been an absolute joy. We've launched three brands with them, a membership club called Side Plus. We've launched a fried chicken restaurant chain called Science. We've launched a vodka brand called XOX Vodka, which are all doing really well. And never thought I'd be like running a restaurant chain. That's the power of social, right? You can do these projects and set them up. And yeah, it's been amazing. It's such a fun experience. Cranely the best thing we've ever done. Coming out of a big corporate entity that was great, but at the same time was corporate by definition, 300 staff, thousands of clients, five offices or whatever, great, but you're just, you by definition have the people challenges, you have the corporate struggles, tensions, restrictions, things are slower, of course. Whereas with this, it's literally just myself, two amazing co-founders next to me, and we just have fun and get on with stuff. And it's always about what's the best decision. Any idea, how quickly can we do it, rather than going through the, you know, the processes constantly. It's been a real lesson for me in, in speed and getting on with stuff and so far it's born amazing fruit and that's a huge part of that of course the biggest part is the boys in their willingness to move at pace because a lot of the time with talent you can get a sort of an anxiety a slowness a, a sense of, of hesitation but they're so confident in their ability and in their power and in their audience which is the biggest again out there that it means that creatively we can just do stuff, put it out, and if it's good, it will and it resonates and it provides an access point for fans, and it takes off. So yeah, it's been been a lot of fun. The fun thing with them is, this, you know, they've got 100 million people between them. There's 15 million following them mm. on their main sort of YouTube channel. But it's, it's almost definitely the most popular content format. The Simon Sunday series, which I do every Sunday mm. in the country, more than any TV show. If you were to like put the numbers up against an ITV against anyone, it would blast them all. So it's crazy because again, it's, it doesn't get the the recognition that it deserves from the mainstream, by definition, because it's, you know, the people in in the sort of traditional media places don't really see it. So, you know, they see it as a threat almost, I think. And there's a little bit of a, oh, well, these guys have come up and done their own thing, they're challenging us over here in our big towers who kind of spend millions and billions doing it and then managing to get the same success. So there's definitely that kind of tension. But it's, I think it means, again, in terms of that community and the audience, You've, we've got the best bet to test and to try things and to do yeah. stuff because it's there's just so many people. But the print the principles are the same. I think is to a community of fifteen, twenty, a hundred million to a community of thousands of our freedians, where it's about you know giving value back and creating that two way dialogue more than anything and listening and not thinking, not trying to dictate to them, but making them ultimately dictate to you and have that two way relationship. And when that works, then things really start to flow. We've definitely found that across all our brands, but especially I think Side Plus, which is our membership club. That's been an amazing thing of, you know, the most diehard core fans who love the boys want more from them. How do we make a club for them? Not our own thing that we're trying to get them to conform to, if that makes sense. I think TV piece is really interesting because it's, it's, yeah, it's optically, or, or for a lot of people over a certain age, it's still the credible space. So it's where there's credibility, it's, it's legitimate, it's growing up, it's proper people think that the numbers on YouTube, as we know, and on social, far outweigh the numbers on TV. Obviously working with a lot of people in TV. If you've got 300,000 views on a, that's like, wow, that's amazing. Everyone's really happy. Like the biggest TV show, um, which I was fortunate enough to work on, was Saturday Night Takeaway um, with Anton Day. That was getting like 10 million for its prime time. Like the, that was the biggest of the year of everything. Amazing show, huge numbers, of course, but the side would get that like every week or near, near to that every single week. So I think it, it's interesting that there is still that gap and ultimately that will change in time as people who are growing up on YouTube and online see that as 
what's relevant and cool and, and, and the thing that people are talking about in the playground rather than TV where actually if you went around the whole of, whole of, um, of Cannes, how many people would even know about the people on TV? <laughs> really, how many people even watch TV? I doubt many. And I bet if you surveyed them, 95% to nearly 100% would be on YouTube, I think probably maybe 10% would be on TV. So yeah, there's a gap there, but I think that will change generationally as ultimately these guys and us sort of come through the ranks. The Lab Bible, back in 2015, 16, the sort of Facebook economy when that was kicking off and you had brands and business and publishers like us, magazines, translating online, will be birthed mm. online and then building out businesses of 100, 200, 300 people, billion pound companies being made through Facebook and through Instagram and so on, which is amazing. And now Lab Bible, they floated for like 400 million pounds of I minutes mean, of companies started on Facebook, yeah. principally. Buzzfeed to billion pound companies. So there are many examples now of these, of these businesses that have come through these online channels and to be at the forefront of that, to see how that model works and how much brand you can, can really be there at scale when you're delivering content to like audiences across the world has been great. I think now with the boys, it's the challenge is slightly different, but the principles are the same. You've got this huge audience, the most loved, diehard group of people who really care about them. They've grown up with them for 10 years. They mean more than just creeds and things. They should be with them as like friends almost. And that's why it's one to the generation because they've been doing it for so long and they've caught this nostalgia and this real connection with people because of the sheer amount of time, the journey of growing up with them and so on. It feels like we're really in a, again, one to the generation thing, which has never been done before, which is now trying to bring out more access points than ever for those audience members, and then also trying to build the cyber brands that can outlive them, because ultimately the boys aren't going to want to mm. do this forever, they can't. Yeah. They're all 27, 25 is the youngest, Harry, and then up to 30 now. They're going to want to go on and do other things in their life. So how do we build out as many things for fans as possible that are good and quality and engage them and, and provide access points that allow the boys to then step up as well. So these brands can take one in their own right. So that's what Dari besides XIX especially and any other brand is building them out so they don't rely on all the boys. Which again, never been done really, but it's exciting to try. Yes. It's all about tangible, practical experience. And this is why, and I know, again, in the school, I know it's probably doesn't go down well. And I remember I've spoken at some sort of apprenticeship things with Prince of Trust and everything else. And I always go very hard on university because it's the one topic that I think is, it needs a, hopefully, somewhat of a firm voice on because it's so insane, yeah. to be honest, as a model and so broken and wrong. I was thinking about it. I did not see anybody go through the system. And this is in my generation and I can only speak for my experience and anecdotally, of course, but who's come out better than they started. I can't think of a single person. I've seen, I've met hundreds of people now who've been through the system. I can't think of a single one who's come out better than when they started. And in this space, in the creative media space, you don't need it at all. And I'll say that very bluntly, you do not need it. It's the biggest waste of time. And actually, the, and again, my experience, even on a personal level, the advice, like learning in, that, in those six weeks, more than I could ever learn in a course about digital culture and about the reality of work. And actually, that set me up better than any degree could have done. And then going to the to Kings and experiencing that, that period of time was just, the contrast was so stark. What do people want? They want skills. We have an arcade, like so many people working with us now, obviously because of the boys and their amazing reach and the fandoms they have. Where we've got fans who are like 18, 19 years old who are running our socials, so like building our accounts. We've been doing it for five, six years. The people who we have making our like our 3D and our like, graphic design and our like all of our stuff, to be fair, like they're all young kids pretty much yeah. who come through Discord and like these channels which yeah. people are slightly older wouldn't maybe maybe know. But that's where we're finding talent. It's the people who've been doing it and getting on with it. So if you've got a computer, if you've got a phone, you can get all the skills you need to practically work in, in this space. You will not even touch those skills a degree. The COVID experience for people as well was just, I think, the kick in the teeth and made, and I think one of the blessings of the best things about that was it probably woke a lot of people up to the reality, which feels less of a reality when you're tangibly in the space. You're still, you know, at a campus. It feels like it's maybe more meaningful. But during COVID, when people were at home saying, hang on, I'm paying, I'm getting no reduction in my fee. I'm still paying the same amount to have my nine hours a week. I remember I have like nine hours a week. Mm -hmm. And now those nine hours, uh, maybe four of them are online and that's it. And it's just in the rest you have to do yourself. Sorry. And for this space, again, I've not once seen a degree that, uh, not once. No. You've never looked at a degree. I've never, when I was hiring at YVU or LAD or Vice, wherever, never seen any degree mentioned ever. I think the, the culture, especially at the time, maybe 2015 was a bit different, but the way people went on about uni, you, you'd think that it was <laughs> it was your your flag and your oh sign when God. you went in yeah. to any place, and it's not mentioned at all. So in this space, yeah. so I would urge people to <laughs> don't go <laughs> and and to think about it at least because it, and I'm always available. It's one of the things that I've 
got a nice chat record of doing is helping people, I think, to just question it at least and just to challenge it a bit because it's easy not to, I think. One thing that I'd love Cass to do more of is, is apprenticeships. I think people, people get to the end of school and they have they start making that choice. Like, Am I doing this for money? Really? Work? Like, is it really to ultimately make money and, and do well financially, whatever that means to some people? Or is it like to follow a passion? Or, or is it then to study maybe over here? And I think for both of those things, I think passion, you won't know what is available in the world of work until you start. That's one thing. I, you don't know what jobs exist. And you think uni is going to give you that. It doesn't really. What does is actually doing work experience. Meeting people, trying to network, getting out there, like going out and just experiencing the world will show you the jobs that are there. And then through that, you'll find something which could become a passion. And then you won't know if it's a passion until you start doing it. So it's a chicken and egg situation. But on the money side as well, apprenticeships, getting stuck in, getting further along on either of those paths than doing a degree in liberal arts or whatever, it's so far removed from the reality of where you're going to have to go anyway. Mm. And I think also the piece today is that things are exceptionally challenging for people who are coming through now where everything's a lot more expensive. There are less jobs that are available. Wages haven't grown. Like, cost of living and things have gone up drastically. It's really hard. So, again, there's no luxury for uni anymore. The world has really transformed and gone against people now in a way that it was before, but it's just accelerated over the last couple of years. So I think the urgency to start life, to start work, to start getting on is now heightened more than ever before. And I think because of that, where once you could say, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out and then I'll, I'll go. I don't think that option exists anymore in the same way because things are just so in crisis from a grander social political position. And that's where apprenticeships and things are incredible. So much value, way more value, just getting in and working and doing that for three years. Then, you know, any, again, any degree in this space, there's so many people who don't go down that practical route. If you can start early, best thing I did, honestly, was dropping out and starting at 18 because I got so much further ahead so much quicker because I was able just to go for it. And because of that, it meant that I've been now working for like seven years, seven years, <laughs> I'm 24, 10, 25 this year. Um, whereas there are people I know who haven't left uni yet and so they're just starting now. So another seven years of 25, let's say, then you're all what they So it's, it's tricky. But anyway, it's definitely not easy. And that's why on a personal level that I'm always here to talk to people. And I love like helping people work it out just because sometimes they need a different perspective just to be like, no, have you thought about this in a, yeah, in, in a tangible, practical way. And you mentioned you'd spoken at the Princess Trust and stuff. Yeah. Involved, involved yeah, so I did a talk with Anton Deck, actually. Mm -hmm. So they, they were doing a course with the Princess Trust and I went and spoke to a bunch of students there and sort of gave, gave them the, the thought when the question came up as well as sort of some, just some tangible experience about space and about media and everything else. Actually, one of the people there, he sort of shone out a little bit and was asking brilliant questions and, and everything. He ended up mentoring him for quite a while. I mean, he reached out. It was just, just amazing. Gokul Melvin he started working with us as a team assistant. And I think we just hired him, like, beginning of this week was his first week. So that was quite a nice full circle thing. But yeah, I was spoken there, I spoke at like Mediacom and I did a bunch of agencies with students and just quite a few, I think quite a few forums speaking to younger people like myself about this. And you won't know what you love until you do it. So don't do what you think you love. Do it. And obviously it's a decent place to start, but almost you have to build your passion. And you can build, you can find a passion being a plumber, being builder being anything that you might unless you want to start in, in one field actually doing something else will give you the experience to find your passion and i think that principle is quite relevant it's something that i hadn't really thought about before and i think going out into the world of work and seeing it it's so true you don't know what jobs exist the only thing i found on, on vice's website was a job called creative and i said okay that's what i want to do because i like being creative that was it and actually in reality there are hundreds of jobs that i had no idea even existed that are brilliant and so somebody coming up you've got basic skills or things that you know you're good at it's almost like following those skills first getting into something and then finding your passion through what you're good at then doing what you maybe love or you think you love because you won't know that until you start i think it, it, if it wasn't for cast i would never have i think had the freedom to be so creative throughout my school time things like music tech with dan i remember we had an as group of maybe three or four of us that whole period of time was brilliant, just experimenting, just playing, like having that, having all the facilities and the resources. I remember also doing Unplugged and all the music stuff we did, all the, the plays and the musicals, just the whole experience was so creatively driven. I set up my clothing company here, but didn't do it for that long, but like was able to have all the people here to, to do it with. Photographers and models and all that, and it was great. And even the resources are. I remember the music building where we were with Max and everything else. And it was just an environment of creativity where it was all about expression and making things and creating. And because of that, I had enough of an inkling that that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. 
which then gave me that that filter to say, right, I like being creative. There's a job called a creative at a company. Let me speak to them and see. And from there, I then obviously ended up moving into that, becoming a creative intern, junior creative, and getting that job. But that was because of ultimately the creative skills I was able to acquire here. So I owe a lot, infinitely. I owe so much to this place because of that foundation that it gave me ultimately to be creative and then do what I'm doing now.